Street Life Ministries, uh, take one. <laughs> you have to I'm, do that. I'm, to, I'm, I'm gonna leave that. I can't look at your face and do this interview, bro. I'm, I'm uh, gonna find something to look at. I'm actually. I, hey, okay. Tommy. Tommy, leave that part in. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this is probably gonna be the best interview, if not the hardest interview, I've done yet. Street Life Ministries is a Christ-following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people. And today, we'd like to share one of those with you. I am so glad to uh, sit down with a good friend of mine, Ted Melendez, pastor over at uh, Church of the Highlands, and a good friend, and uh, has an amazing, amazing testimony. Um, and, uh, give all the glory to God. Amen. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, let's start off in prayer, and then we'll go from there. Uh, Lord, I just uh, want to come to you uh, today, this morning, with my friend Ted. God, just uh, bless our time together. Bless this conversation, Lord. And uh, as you have uh, blessed his life and um, taken him through um, an amazing journey um, in his path from very young to now, uh, God, and the things that you have done in his life with his marriage and now being a pastor, God, uh, just let this message uh, bless those who will watch and listen to this uh, podcast, uh, Lord, and bless our time together uh, this morning, God. And we give all glory to you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Ted. Yes. Sir. Let's see if we can get through this yes, without. Friend. Let's see if we can get through this without being too sarcastic with each other. Okay. You think so? Oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> so, anyway, so tell me um, a little bit about yourself. Born and raised, where? Mom and dad, brothers, sisters, all that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm uh, I'm the youngest. Or I was until Ancestry.com came out. But <clears throat> growing up, I was the youngest. I had one older brother, one older sister, and uh, my mom and dad uh, came from Puerto Rico. Uh, my dad left when I was about nine, <clears throat> and um, I grew up in the Bayview District, San Francisco, and uh, it was a rough area, kind of. I moved from the real rough side to the other side, which is uh, on the other side of Silver Avenue, San Bernardino Avenue, and um, yeah, it was a little rough. You know, my family drank a lot, and um, I had a normal, kind of a normal Growing up, uh, I remember like, from kindergarten probably till about second grade <laughs> is where I think it was only normal. And then even after that, I was already cutting school and, you know, driving my mini bike, taking off all over the place. But, um, yeah, it was pretty normal. Uh, we had a lot of family parties where I learned how to drink. Um, a lot of people wonder how their children can become alcoholics. Well, you know, we're the example. My example was my mom and dad who, who drank and my whole family who had New Year's parties, whatever. And uh, I remember stealing alcohol, zipping out of people's cups. I remember them giving it to me just to see my funny face I would make after tasting it, the hard liquor, <clears throat> which actually you know, started me on my, my drinking binge. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty no normal neighborhood. After about second, third grade, I was already stealing. I was already uh, stealing from my mom's purse, um, stealing stuff at school, doing things, even going in, uh, we used to call it Bell Variety on San Bernardino Avenue. It was a dime, five and dime store. I'd go in there and steal stuff, and my mom would go, where'd you, where'd you get that? You know, it'd be Hot Wheels when they first came out. It's probably, uh, that was probably in the 60s still, probably 68, 69, and I uh, wish I had those still. <laughs> but, uh, and I told her, oh, a friend gave it to me, but I was already, I was already thieving, you know? <clears throat> As I got older, probably by the time I, well, at, well let me take it back, because I was nine years old, um, I already started drugs, started marijuana. Wow. Uh, my, older, my older brother kind of, had his friends one day and they all thought it would be funny to give me a hit of some marijuana so they put it in the old supercharger and <clears throat> blew it in my face told me to suck in and next thing you know I was on the floor and all I remember was looking up and watching everybody looking down at me laughing and then after that I was curious you know I would steal it out of my brother's drawer and I would start doing it smoking it by the time I was 12 uh, just getting in junior high school I was already selling and um, yeah so about that only really lasted of course I was smoking and drinking all the way till I was 14 Barely made it out of junior high school. I had straight F's. They didn't want me in the school anymore, so they moved me on to high school, uh, which lasted only six months. I uh, beat up my counselor, got thrown out of there. And uh, then I tried to go to work, you know, and then I met a group of guys who were uh, out stealing tape decks and doing stuff like that. So I started hanging out with them, and I'm like, wow, easy money. Next thing you know, I was learning how to steal motorcycles, steal cars. How old? Uh, 15, probably. Wow. Yeah, so... Wow, you started young. Oh, yeah. So every, everything everything was very young. And, um, yeah. But people always ask me, I mean, you really never got to see a normal, you know, family, whatever. I don't think I ever did. I mean, 
remember we went to a couple trips Russian River. That was kind of normal, I guess. I even got a picture of me when I was eight, you know, in the river sitting there, like messing with pebbles or something. But I think that was the only part that I remember that was normal. But yeah, I was already stealing by 15, 16. Um, went to jail my first time uh, when I was 18. I got caught stealing a stereo out of a, ended up being a house of an FBI agent. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so... Uh, Who would have known, huh? Yeah, I don't know, yeah. So the cops came, and that turned into... It was kind of violent. The cop, you know, told me to get out of the car, and I had a big flashlight, hit him in the face with a flashlight, and knocked him down, and took off running. And then uh, then I got tackled by some other cops. And it turned out that the judge wanted to make an example of me, the first time ever getting caught. So they gave me uh, five years probation, and they get three months in the county jail. And, uh, of course, I ran. I never went to jail. I, and I learned, wow, it's pretty easy to run from the cops. But that lasted a couple of years, and then they ended up catching me. So I already started the jail life, you know, at the age of 18. I never went to the juvenile. I went to juvenile court once for, for a speeding ticket, which I wasn't supposed to be driving. <laughs> and uh, other than that, yeah, then I, then I started going through the system. You know, then I started getting caught for things, uh, stealing. Um, you know, I started uh, doing number jobs on cars, which meant, you know, you steal a car, you change the numbers, sell it. Mm-hmm. I started doing that, became easy money. Then I started, I started really getting heavy in the drugs. I was doing cocaine, mm-hmm. um, uh, a lot of marijuana. Um, sure. Of course, drinking. Drinking became like a normal to me. It was like drinking water. But yeah, so I had a whole life of doing that. And then um, by the time I was 20, which was 1980, uh, I did my first uh, prison sentence. Mm-hmm. And that was in Vacaville Prison. Uh, yeah, so I got a little taste of that. And it wasn't so bad, you know, so... I ended up coming back, and then I got a year in the county jail, Redwood City, right here in Redwood City. And I did a full year in that place, and I think that was worse than prison, staying in a building, no air. <laughs> and, uh, and then it just became a normal part of my life. I started stealing more bikes. I started stealing Harley Davidsons. I started stealing Kawasaki's. I started stealing cars for body shops that were hiring me because they didn't want to pay for the parts because the carts were like cars were high class cars. So they would give me a list, and I'd go out and steal them. You know what I mean? And they would pay me for doing that. And then uh, the Harley Davidsons became a. I counted every one of them, 48 Harleys that I stole. And uh, wow. And uh, one of them was a police motorcycle. I won't say which one, but... <laughs> so, so, yeah, all my friends were like, you're, you're losing it. And I was losing it because it was all about drugs. I got involved in snorting cocaine, smoking cocaine. I got involved with... Uh, after cocaine became, became methamphetamine because it was cheaper and it lasted longer. And then became PCP and LSD. I did LSD for three years straight almost every day of my life. Wow. I was putting it in my mouth. I was dropping it in my eyes. <clears throat> um, oh, that's right, because back then it was liquid. Yeah, yeah the, liquid. The, the yeah, L, you put it on L, the sugar cube. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, and then I, I used to have just, I think I've had every type of LSD you can imagine. I used to work at the airport in 1978 on LSD. So wow. I was flying. <laughs> I was really flying. When the airplanes were flying, <laughs> I was flying the other Wow. Way. But, uh, yeah, I had a friend down by the beach where I would, we would take our lunch break, fly down there. He would put a couple of drops on the sugar cube. We would eat it. By the time we came back, we were already high. Uh, then it wouldn't affect me anymore. I was doing so much. He started dropping it in my eyeball. So then from after that, I, I got out of that. I mean, I was doing mushrooms and all that stuff. I've done every drug on the street, just about. I've done sure. heroin, smoking it. Never stuck a needle in my arm with a drug, but I did smoke heroin, which was that one I didn't like so much because was, there was no control. I didn't have any control over anything. And uh, You had control when you are on LSD? Oh, yeah. I knew what I was doing. I mean, I was working. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting because I, I, I bet the couple times I took LSD in high school and stuff, I... <clears throat> I didn't have any control. Yeah. It was weird. I just I remember I remember getting high and walking for hours and <laughs> and then get to the get to a destination that I had no idea why I was even going there. Yeah. So really quick, so your dad left when you were held? Nine. Nine. Did you did you have any contact with him since then? You know what? I'm sorry. I did move back in with him when I was 16 okay. for one year in Daly City, and I stayed with him for a year. He was like a bouncer at a bar, so I would go to that bar with him every night. You know, right. and we would drink together and party together and fight together with other people and. You know, then uh, he left me again when I was 17. He took mm-hmm. off to Puerto Rico. That's when I had two new sisters, you know, so sure. that I didn't, one was three and one was just born. And um, <clears throat> I just recently, they found me through my daughter on Ancestry.com. Now one's 44, one's 47. Right. And uh, the one who was 47 said she remembered having a brother, but she couldn't remember who. So I, so I have two more sisters there. Then my dad went to Puerto Rico. He left me one morning. I was actually sleeping in the garage because his young girlfriend, he was 47, she was 21. And uh, she didn't like me. She didn't want me staying there. So my dad said, hey, there's a separate garage. I stayed in there on a cot, you know, and I remember his bumper used to be right here. I used to use it as an armrest and watch a little TV on top of the tool bench. 
But one morning I heard him loading the car and I was like, you know, where are you going? He goes, I'm leaving. I'm going to Puerto Rico. And I was like, we're going to Puerto Rico? He said, no, I'm going to Puerto Rico. He goes, you can do whatever you want. So I was 17 and I'm like, what am I going to do? So I slept in cars. I went through a lot of other stuff. You know, sure. Which, which, sure. You know, and, and I made my living from stealing. You know, if I didn't have that, you right. know, and, and most of it went to drugs. You know, I bought drugs, rented hotel rooms, called my friends. Hey, what's going on? We got everything here, you know. Wow. And uh, yeah, so that was my whole life, pretty much, doing all that. That's junk. pretty crazy. Yeah. So you're, so you're in your 20s, you're, uh, it's 1978, you work at the airport, you drop an acid. I was 18 then, yeah. 18. Oh, you're 18 then. Okay. Yeah. So you, when you when you did your first time in Vacaville, yeah. you were at 20. 20. And then you get out, you're robbing and stealing cars and Harleys, 48 Harleys, one police <laughs> car, one police motorcycle. Um, uh, and then... Um, so it's interesting, I just, really quick, I just wanted to point something out. So the Bayview District, when you were young, was was also still pretty shady. Oh, yeah. And now it's, I mean, we're 2021, and it's still a pretty rough pretty, pretty rough neighborhood. I was it's just getting there. a little I was, better, but yeah, it's rough. I was just there last week, and it's, yeah. it's yeah, it's a pretty tough, pretty tough neighborhood. Yeah, Third and Rivera, it's pretty yeah, tough. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's interesting how that's always had that, that cloud of darkness over that area, yeah. interestingly enough. Um, okay, so fast forward. You're in your twenties. What, what's what's the where's where's some of the next chapters in your life? And and um, I got married when I was twenty three. Yeah, I take that back. I got married when I was twenty seven. <laughs> okay. So between that, I became oh between twenty three and twenty seven, I became a money collector down in North Beach. Okay. Uh, for a guy who was, you know, he wasn't so tough, but he sold a lot of cocaine, and he needed somebody to collect for him. So he goes, "Would you like to try it?" I said, "Sure." So, <laughs> sure, why not? I, I still remember Gino and Carlos. Uh, Gino and Carlos right next to Columbus Cafe. I was, well, he got me all amped up on Cokes. I was already, you know, and he said, See that guy in there? He owes me money. And I went over and knocked him right off his school stool, took his wallet out of his pocket, and took whatever he had out of it. And I walked out, and the guy was like, Okay, you're, you're hired. <laughs> so I did that for about two years, and uh, it was pretty shady deals going on underground down there. All kinds, I'm not going to mention a lot of it, but sure. it was pretty crazy. I did that, but I. And it wasn't crazy to me because I grew up crazy in my neighborhood. I had a bunch of guys we grew up with. We were in our teens. We'd walk around and just, you know, we'd fight other neighborhoods. We'd go down to wharf takeover areas, uh, arcade places. The guy, the guy would run and we would sit there and take over everything. You so know? really quick, I just want to ask you. So at, at, at any point from your childhood to now, because um, today you're a pastor. So I just want to yeah. know at, at any point in that time, was God really ever introduced into your life? Did you know of God, and did you? What was your thought process of God? Because obviously you're you're not running with God. Yeah, my mom. Time. They made me go to a Catholic church, mm-hmm. you know, uh, St. Elizabeth's in San Francisco. Never got anything out of it. Didn't understand any of it. You know, all I could think about was taking the money out of the baskets. <laughs> How can I get that money out of the basket? Right. So never. Uh, not till I was. I'm trying to think of my next prison sentence because that's where it happened. It was. Uh, so my last arrest was 1989, and I went to San Quentin. July 20th, 1990. I remember that because that was the day I quit smoking cigarettes. <laughs> and um, I got introduced to to God then. Actually, one guy in 1980 in the prison there tried to talk to me about it, but I wasn't there. I wasn't listening. And uh, But in San Quentin, for some reason, it, it really hit me hard. They have doors over by death row. And if you're like a Christian, you go to this door. If you go to Catholic, you go to this door. So I went to the Catholic because that's the way I was raised. And my other buddy of mine I said, I, that was in there at the same time I was, he went to the Christian one, you know, and, and they were kind of like right next to each other. So while we're in this place, there was like three people in it. And the guy was like, I don't even know what he was saying, you know, and I'm looking, like I hear like a music beat going on next door. And like they were jamming something. I was like, what's going on with a rock concert, right? So when I walk out the door, my buddy's out, he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, like, a, dude, what's, you guys have a concert over there? And they go, dude, it's, we're worshiping, man, Christian music, man. The inmates were in there, they were playing. I was like, he goes, next time you come, just say you're Christian. I said, all right. So the next weekend I went in and I go, Christian, then they right through here. And I went inside and, and I think that was the first real time God, God started working on my heart. That's cool. And uh, I remember the pastor, I can't remember his name. He prayed for my mom. I was always praying for, you know, I wanted prayer for my mom because my mom raised us all by herself, me right. and my brother and sister. <clears throat> it was a rough time. Uh, none of us were like normal. <laughs> we always say that the government put something in our water because my whole neighborhood is crazy. But um I really got touched, and I think that was the first time I had a little tear come out because you know I didn't, I didn't cry, you know what I mean? Sure. And uh, and then I remember the next following weekend, like the, the bars weren't opening, and I was like, okay, hey, it's church time. I'm like, open the bars already, and you know, I couldn't wait to go, you know. 
then they shipped me to another prison, you know, and then I, and then the pastor there wasn't so, he was more about himself. Mm-hmm. So I kind of got turned off by that. So God was after me, you know I mean? There was sure. little messages coming at me and I think that would have been, been the last time though. There, there was a guy in uh, 1987, I was in Redwood City Jail again. I spent a lot of time in Redwood City Jail who he had a chapel and I can't remember his name. Great guy, you know, I, I didn't go there to listen to him. I went there because I was getting out of my cell, of course, like most guys do. And um, it was funny because he actually, I ran into him again in 2006. And I was already at Highlands by then. I was already going to church. I was a Christian. And it was funny. He was walking by me. I didn't know his kid went to our school. Interesting. So I'm walking past him. And he looks at me and goes, Redwood City Jail. I go, you the guy that did the chapel thing. He was like, yeah. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm a Christian. And he started crying. And I was like, what are you crying for? And he's just like, man, it's just great to see somebody. He goes, you just never know when it's going to happen. Right. And uh, so it was a great experience then. So, But anyway, I tried other things. Never tried a church after that but that one time in San Quentin. That was pretty much it. I went back in gang mode. I mean, we people call them gangs now. We didn't call it gangs. We were just guys who hung out and sure. like to beat the crap out of people. Excuse my language. Right. But, uh, uh, we had neighborhoods that were real tough that we'd fight against. And two of the toughest neighborhoods was ours and another one. And we all became friends, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a long story how that happened. Um, it was through a motorcycle club, but I'll leave it there. And um, <laughs> we all became, once we became friends, everybody else was like, oh no, we're all in trouble. Uh, so that, yeah, my, whole life, my whole life was fighting. I used to love to fight. You know? Right. I'm a short guy, you know, and I used to love taking on bigger guys because it was like, all right, cool. And if I lost, eh, he was bigger than me, you know what I mean? Right, right. Which didn't happen too often. But uh, yeah, I, I, I became a nut. Um, so, okay, so... so I, I had a three-year I, sentence in that last one, but go ahead. Yeah, um, so that's what I wanted to get to. So, because <clears throat> your, your amazing transformation and testimony is as, as, as what I want to get to, too, because it's so powerful. Good. So, yeah. so <clears throat> maybe really quick, what was, your, what was your absolute bottom that got you to be like, okay, I'm really going to reach out to Christ and then go from... Okay. From there, because because that, that's that's the part that I yeah. think that people really want to hear too. So my bottom, I call it Tina. Mm. It was my wife. Okay. So my second wife, first wife, that marriage lasted six months, you know, and I had a daughter from that. She's now thirty three years old. Um, I got custody of her when she was eleven, and uh, I met my wife now, Tina, and um, at that time I was selling a lot of drugs. I was selling thirty pounds of weed a month. Mm. Um, so I'm pretty good. I was a tattoo artist, became a tattoo artist. Uh, I was doing a lot of Giants players. And so I was making good money. Uh, only problem with me was I had a bad ex- uh, example of a husband. Mm. Watching my dad used to beat up my mom a lot too. That was another thing. There was a lot of violence in my house. Brother, sister, everybody fighting all the time. And um, so I treated my wife pretty bad. You know, mm. she was young. She was 20. I was 35. You know, and uh, people always tell me, ooh, that's... Kind of rocking the boat. Well, my wife changed me, and she'll tell you that. But uh, we had to get. I, I know Tina, and I know yeah. she. Uh, yes, I, I can. <laughs> I can test that. So anyway, so we got together, and uh, she became my slave, pretty much. You know, she did whatever I told her. Um, I didn't even give her a key to the house. I was so jealous, and I was so uh, controlling. She didn't have a key. She couldn't leave without me. She couldn't go anywhere without me. I stopped her from seeing her family. Uh, she wanted to go see her family, in Modesto. I'm like, no. You know, we're gonna do this. I was pretty. I was pretty mean to her. Uh, we get violence, screaming. My daughter saw it all. It was pretty sad. My daughter used to watch me deal in the drugs. We'd be sitting there smoking pot, drinking. Whatever. She'd be right there. Uh, I thank God that she didn't get into it. You know, at least the marijuana thing. <clears throat> but um, I think we were together for about almost five years. And one day uh, we got in a big fight, and here's my bottom. You know, she went to work and never came back. And by then, you know, I, w- I would always take her to work because she didn't drive. She just goes, I'm going to walk. And it wasn't that far away. It was probably a quarter of a mile. I said, yeah, go ahead. You know, whatever. So then she never came home. And that was my bottom. You know, it was like, okay, okay, where'd she go? So I went down to her work. I talked to her manager. I go, hey, is my wife here? And I go, no. She's not. No. So me being a, a seven-strike felon, <laughs> seven strikes on my record. Yeah. yeah. Um, I went to the police department, let them know what happened, and I said, look, if anything happens to her, I want to make sure that you know it's not me, you know, so then they went and talked to her boss, found out that she was okay, she had, and some lady had took her home, a Spanish lady, and uh, they said she wants to come home and get a few of her things, just some clothes, and I said, that's fine, so they brought her there, she took it, and 
I was kind of happy. I was like, okay, I'm free again. It's party time, you know. And I had friends come over and we'd party. And that went on for just a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. And right away, I started thinking, okay, I kind of miss her. <laughs> and um, I found out that she became a Christian. That lady was a Christian. She took my, uh, my wife to a Spanish church in San Francisco down off uh, 24th and Metro. And um, I was like, when I heard about it, I'm like, how could she, she didn't even understand Spanish. <laughs> she never talked about God ever, you know. And um, I said, I'm going to check into this Christian thing, you know. So I went on the internet and I'm starting to look. And the first thing I see is this guy named Jose from a singles thing, you know, like a dating thing. My name's Jose. I'm a Christian in San Jose. And I'm like, yeah, she's probably with him, you know. And my daughter used to watch me and she'd go, Dad, get away from that. Get away from that. Don't, don't start, you know, because I, I, would, I would get furious. And uh, that's where it all started. And uh, one day, I was so depressed that I sat there. It was probably 7.30 in the morning, maybe. And I had my front door open with the screen door shut. And I lived right in the cemeteries in Colma. And uh, I'm already drinking, and I'm snorting, and I'm smoking, and I'm partying. And I'm just trying to just get rid of the depression, you know? And I think that's what most people do drugs, to get rid of the depression, not realizing that it's going to get you more depressed later. Um, that, that was truly my bottom. And... A friend of mine came over that day that had never ever been to my house. You know, I was actually I was in the saltwater tanks, fish tanks, so I tattooed a few of his guys in the shop, and they gave me free stuff as trade. <clears throat> but I always went there here at San Mateo, and he showed up one day and he walks in the house and he sees all my house is a wreck because I was so mad I was breaking things and everything. And he goes, "What happened?" And I told him and I said, "Yeah, I looked at this Christian thing, but I don't know, man." I'm wondering what's going on with my wife. And he's all like, he goes, you know. And then there was actually a site that I went to. And it said, if you text, if you give us your email, we'll pray for you. So I did that. But they never answered me. I thought they were phonies. So then I told him about that. And he said, well, here's a phone number. You call it. You know, my mom goes to this church in San Bruno. It's called Church of the Highlands. And they have a great pastor there. He's a really neat guy, you know. And I said, yeah, just put it there. You know what I mean? And, you know, and the next day I remember calling and... I talked to this girl on the phone, and she actually prayed for me, mm. which which kind of touched me, you know? I get, this girl doesn't even know me, you know what I mean? Sure. And she goes, well, I want to pray for you. And then I asked to speak to the, to the I thought it was a priest back then. <laughs> so who's your priest, you know? And they go, well, we have a pastor, but he's, he's not here. He won't be back till Friday. Still remember. That was on a Tuesday. I still remember. And um, I, she goes, but we have other elders and pastors, and I said, well, I want to speak to the main guy. I don't want to speak to the in-betweeners, you know. And uh, sure enough, she set me up for that Friday, and that was the day I walked in and met Pastor Donald Sheely. And uh, we walked in a room, and I'm looking around, and I'm going, wow, this place is weird. I still, I remember I had a big old fat joint rolled in my car, and I wanted to take a couple of hits before I went in because my nerves were kind of going to the church. Uh. But then I thought, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have respect for God. I, I, I've always heard of God. I didn't know exactly who he was. Sure. I uh, walked in, met with him, we talked for a little bit, and um, three hours later after praying for me and talking to me, he said something that I'll never forget. He said, I bet you, I bet you your whole life you wish you could start over again. And I went, I've said that many times. Actually got angry at God even though I didn't know who he was. Like, why'd you put me in this family? You know, why'd you put me in a better family? Why'd you put me in a better neighborhood? How can I be like these rich kids that are growing up with you know, nice homes and pools and everything sure. else. So, sure. <clears throat> so he, um, <clears throat> when he said that, it really hit me. And I said, yeah. And he said, today, your slate can be wiped clean. So right away in my worldly way of thinking, I'm thinking, oh, my whole record's going to be quite clean. The police department, everything. Yeah. And he goes, no. He goes, your slate will be wiped clean with God. I said, that, that'll work. I, I, I need a lot of forgiveness right now. Um, hurt a lot of people in my life. And uh, some of them still hit me. But uh, <clears throat> I got on my knees that day, May 22nd, 2004, 3 o'clock. I remember looking at the clock, and I gave my life to Jesus. Now, at that time, I was drinking two-fifths of liquor a night, uh, smoking a quarter ounce of weed a day, probably 100 bucks worth a day, maybe a little bit more, and other stuff. Couldn't quit for the life of me. Tried, tried many times. My daughter used to cry when I told her I was going to quit because I'd go, why are you crying? She goes, because you get violent. Mm. And... Uh, that day I walked out of the church and I don't know what happened. It just, it was gone. There was no more urges for pot. There was no more urges for drinking. There was more, no urge for anything. So you I, didn't need that joint in your car anymore? 
No, when I left Highlands, I went down the street, made a right turn, ripped it up, threw it out the window. I had six pounds of weed sitting in my house still at that point. That's awesome. And I had dark curtains in my house. I went mm -hmm. home. My daughter thought I was losing my mind. I walked in. I started ripping all the curtains down. I went to the store, bought flowery curtains. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and uh, I called all my customers because I still had to pay for the pot. I couldn't give it back to the dealers. They didn't want it back. So I, I said, today and tomorrow, wholesale, my price. People came, bought it all from me, got rid of it all. Got rid of all my paraphernalia, gave it away, and from that day forward, I've been clean ever since, without even a struggle. And and wow. I and from that point, that's when I knew, I knew God was real. So you have a year more than me. That's interesting. So yeah. May May two thousand four. Yeah, May twenty second. Yeah. And I'm I'm July twenty fourth. Uh, I'm sorry, July twenty first, two thousand five. That's yeah. interesting. Oh, that's cool. Hold right yeah. on. But after that, my daughter thought I was losing my mind. And uh, at that time, I took all my wife's stuff out of the house, put it in the cellar, had the bedroom set up like for a single guy, you know. But that day, I walked downstairs and pulled all her stuff up, set the room back up like she was there. And my daughter really thought I was losing my mind. And I told her I was a Christian. And she said, I'm not going to church. I said, you don't have to go to church. Mm. I said, but I'm going to church. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she goes, you know, she's not coming back. She doesn't, she doesn't love you anymore. She this is Tina. Yeah. She yeah. had talked to my daughter on the phone. And this is my daughter from my first marriage, but she was like her mom. And she just told her, she goes, I don't want to be with your dad anymore. I just want you to know that. I, I, she goes, I got a weight lifted off me like I've never had before. And I told my daughter, I don't care what she said. You know what I mean? I'm just going to keep going to church. And sure enough, um, there's this girl that both of us knew who had called me and was telling me about my wife going to the Spanish church and all that stuff, Rebecca. And um, she invited me to a party at her house, which was on a Saturday. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Yeah, I think it was a Saturday. And I said, is my wife going to be there? And she goes, yeah. And I said, she ain't going to want to be there. And she goes, I already talked to her. She said, she doesn't care that you're there. I was like, okay. So I went and, you know, I was mingling with people. And my wife came in. I was just like, wow, first time seeing her. It's like I saw her for the first time. Wow. You know, and it was. It That's was, so cool. It was weird. And she even told me, she said, when she saw me, she looked at my eyes and she said she saw something completely different. Clean. It wasn't me. You're, yeah, you're yeah. saved. You're sober. Yeah. And um, I had told her, I, cool. I, yeah, I told her, I said, uh, I go, how you doing? She goes, fine. And she goes, so I heard you went to church or something. And I said, yeah. And she goes, yeah, I'm going to that church uh, tonight. Yeah, it was Saturday. So she went to the Saturday night service. And I go, oh. I go, she goes, yeah, I heard him on the radio. I thought he was pretty cool. That's the way. It, I thought it was totally different. My wife kind of straightened the story out for me. So she went that Saturday night. We spent the day together. You know, and neither one of us, we were all sucked up. We were like thin because we weren't eating because we were depressed. And uh, we ate really good that day because we saw each other. And um, she went to church that night. Pastor Shealy was talking about me, how he came in. He didn't say my name. He just said this guy came in. So she called me that night about 10 o'clock at night and she said, hey, you want to go to church in the morning? And I go, sure. And I go, where do you live? <laughs> I'll pick you up. So she gave me her address. We kind of redated. Went to, you know, went to church together. Then I went to her church. We're kind of going back and forth, and God, uh, mm. God got us to to stay at that church, and um, mm. it was just amazing. God brought us back together within a few weeks, and uh, it was amazing mm. the way it happened. Because uh, I remember my pastor said, "I said he goes, you need to pray for your wife." I said I had this weird controlling thing still going on, like yeah. I felt like I had to make moves for her, otherwise she's gonna make a wrong move. She was like a kid to me, yeah. and uh, he said, "Just pray that God would protect her. That's all I want you to do. Don't be greedy." And it was kind of funny because I think two nights later, I went home one night and uh, my daughter was there and my wife lived with this family with these kids. And she called me and said, can, can, your, can your daughter stay with us for overnight? I want her to hang out with me and these kids. And I go, yeah, okay, no problem, you know. And I, you know, my daughter was like my crutch, you know. When I had her there, I wasn't so lonely. I wasn't so, we, I, I played Chinese checkers with her. She, she will not play that game anymore, I guarantee you that. <laughs> um, That's funny. So she went that night. I dropped her off, and uh, and all of a sudden I see my wife. My wife's going like this, and I'm like, "What's up?" She goes, "Oh, you know, it's getting kind of late. Maybe you should go home." And I'm like, "Oh, okay. I guess she doesn't want me here." So I left, and I went home that night. And I still remember uh, I went home, took a shower, threw my sweats on, a t-shirt, and I said, "Maybe I should read my Bible," you know. So I tried to read the Bible. I couldn't read, and it was just it's just it kind of hurt me because I thought she would want to see me, you know. And then I remember when my pastor said, "Don't pray and be greedy." But I got greedy that night. I, I got on my knees that night. I just dropped everything and said, Lord, I love her. There it goes. <laughs> Every time I talk about this part. And I said, uh, I won't hurt her anymore. 
And I said, you know, I, you've changed my life, you've changed her life, and I want her back. I'm gonna be greedy tonight, I want my wife back. And uh, I went to bed that night, turned all the lights off, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you just start dozing off, and you feel yourself going to sleep, kind of. And then all of a sudden I heard a light switch click, right outside my bedroom. And we had one of those hard, those little light switches, you click, click, you know? And I, I thought somebody was in my house, I turned over and it was her standing in my doorway. And I was like, I have supersonic hearing. She'll tell you that. We have a, a loud screen door if you open it. I had changed all the locks on my door except for one. That was the only one I did not lock. I and mean, that was the only one that I locked that night. All the rest of them I did not lock. So she got in the house with that key, opening the door knob. Wow. And she was praying outside, she said, that I wouldn't hear a thing. She got in. She changed. Uh, she showed up in my doorway. It looked like an angel. I'll never forget it. And uh, yeah, we spent the night together, and the next morning she says, "I'm not. I want to stay home." And we've been together ever since. Dude, that's yeah. wow. <laughs> I tell people all the time, if you think there's no miracles, my <clears throat> wife was in San Francisco going to church. I'm in San Bruno. Yeah. God brought her and healed us. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Wow, you just got me on that one. <laughs> It gets me every time. We just had our 22nd year anniversary. So. I've done a couple of these podcasts so far, and that's 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 the first time I've gotten. And I yeah, always try. Not... I always tell married couples: if you think that your marriage cannot work, yeah, must be a sandstorm in here. <laughs> <laughs> Go right across. I'm my glad eyes. I'm not the only Go one. Right across my eyes. Two crazy guys. I were sitting here weeping. We're <laughs> <laughs> such tough guys. <laughs> I give. Oh, so. Man, as you're making but, me. But that's so that's what happened, and, and you know what? And then. Um, I was still tattooing at the time, sure. I was making good money. Of course, I wasn't selling drugs anymore. Right. And um, I decided that after six months, I wasn't going to tattoo anymore. Right. And, and not because of what it says in Leviticus 19.28, don't mark the body. You know, because back then it also says don't eat shellfish, don't shave your face, and all kinds of other stuff. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so we know that was kind of before Jesus. So I did it because of, of the temptations. You know, there's something I always tell people. I used to always say, you have to walk this fine life. I always talk about the... Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, the narrow and the wide gate. Yeah. And I always say, can you imagine how thin it was to that narrow gate to get through? You have to stay on that line. But now I tell people, don't even go near the line. Right. Stay away from it. All temptation. Flee from all temptation. So that was part of it for me. I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. I deleted every phone number off my phone. I changed my phone number. I didn't talk to any of my old friends anymore. I, I just, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do 100% commitment. Sure. And, and that's the way you have to do it. I've done jail ministry for four years. Sure. And I've seen guys come to church and they're there once or twice and then they're gone again. They go back to their old friends. They think they can witness to them. So you, are you saying that half measures don't prevail as success? Yeah. I say you have to give 100% of your heart to God. Yeah. Right. And uh, I believe when guys come in church, I've met guys that come out of jail, they come once and they hear the message and they don't get it. So they go, it didn't do anything to me. Well, how much of your heart did you give to God? Sure. How much percentage? Yeah, because me it was one hundred percent. I went to every Bible study. I went to church every Sunday. Yeah. I made sure that I was full all in. And uh, yeah. if I would have kept in contact with some of my old friends, it wouldn't happen. Right. You know, it's it's for me. Um, I've known you for maybe what three years now, somewhere around there. Somewhere three years. And it's interesting. Like I, I think I have a pretty decent. Um, detector on character of people i don't i don't know you from your past but i know i know enough about you that i know that your past is is legit and who you used who you could have been before and then over the last three years of knowing you um i i i can stand here with 100 percent certainty and i i see a completely 100 percent transformed human being Amen. and um 99 percent um, well, nine, okay, I'll give you. I'll give. I'll give <laughs> I'm you never going to say that. I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> but but I mean, I I know I know enough to know people who are real and who are phony. Yeah. And I know that you're a real human being in in the sense that I know that your past is real, and then who you are today with your marriage. And I've I've seen you interact with your wife. I've my wife had been over to your house for dinner, and I've I've known you enough to know that God. It, it's, I say this because of the fact is is that it, it's it's awesome when you see God grab a hold of somebody a hundred percent. I'm not saying that you're a hundred percent, you're 99, but God's a hundred percent. My 99, but yeah. Yeah, right. I get but it's, it. But it, but it depends on what day of the week it but is. But what's right? more great is when we see somebody else when God gets a hold of them. Well, that's true. So for me, you know, it's that's, I will say that that's one of the things that's really been very powerful in, in my walk and journey is that you know, I've got 15 years sober and, and, and I've, 
And I, I enjoy my life. I enjoy my journey. I enjoy the things yeah. that God has given me. But what I really, really enjoy is, is this. See, seeing, seeing the transformation in other people. Because um, it's real. And, you know, if anybody ever comes to me and says, you know, I'm not sure if God is real and stuff. Man, I'm like, then you haven't given him 100%. That's right. Because I know God's real. Amen. He shows up in men like you. He shows up in women like my wife. Shows up in women like your wife. Amen. You know, I mean, seriously, because like your wife could have been like many, many wives. And said that we're done. Yeah. And she didn't. She allowed God to control her life. Amen. And, and, and she... She allowed him to navigate her back to your house. Yeah, and I always tell people, it's not just, um, I used to always tell people, you need, you need to give your life to Christ. I, I say, now I tell them, you need to surrender your life to Christ. I like that. Yeah, because it has to be a full surrender. I love that. Yeah, and that's something that I'll never, ever forget. Um, say say that, no, so, do, them, do me a favor, say that again. Say what? About Surrender your life to Christ? But don't don't, don't, give don't your just life. give your life to Christ, surrender your life to Christ. Then you go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. And that's one thing that you have to do. And the part with guys like you and me, because I've seen you too, and I've got to know you a little bit. And I know, I, 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 even though we joke around a lot, we, we say things to each other like the old guys. You pick on me. I, I'm no, actually. You, I, I don't. You pick on me. <laughs> I'm the smaller guy, remember? But, uh, <laughs> but you do a lot for God. And I think it's awesome because we don't, we don't just surrender our lives to Christ and then go, okay, I'm good. I'm safe. We need to put work in there. You know, I mean, yeah. you don't work your way there. It's already done deal. It's paid in full on the right. cross. When Jesus went on that cross, it was over. He paid for our sins. He looked down off that cross and saw you and he saw me and he saw everybody and said, I did this for you. It says in Romans chapter 5, I think it's verse 8, where it says at just the right time, Christ died for you, even right. when we were against him. So I try to tell people all the time, I don't care how you feel about God right now. I don't care if you don't even want nothing to do with him. He died for you at the right time. Right. You know what I mean? And when I, whenever I get back in myself and I start tripping off stuff, I, I picture him looking down at me going, Ted, this is for you. He died right. for each and every one of us. He gave us the opportunity to accept him so we can have this life after this life. Some people don't believe it. I had a buddy of mine ask me a long time. He goes, what if it's, what if you're doing all this, bro, and you close your eyes and it's blank? I said, then will it matter? But what if it's not? What if you open your eye and you're yeah. before, before Almighty God Amen. and you're getting ready to get judged? Amen. So, yeah. Uh, but also, But also think about it this way. If if everything that we're following is not real, look, look how much better our lives are. Tell exactly, them. yeah, right. But yeah. but why would I want to be miserable? I I, I or make I, other people miserable. <laughs> absolutely, and I also believe that that the other thing that I I try to share with people too is is it, is it talks about it in, in the book of Luke that you know why would you take a candle and then put a basket over the top of it? Yeah, right. I I think. It's uh, you and I both. I mean, right? We could say I, it would be easy for me just to say, "Well, God has forgiven me for my sins. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm good, right?" And you are. I am good, but but I I just I man, faith without works. I don't want to. I don't want to go without telling people how yeah. how amazing my God is. And, and, and faith without works is dead. It is totally dead. So people, are like, you're not working for it. You're doing it because you're so thankful, right, for the grace and mercy and love that He showed you. Right. No matter what you did, and I tell people all the time, I don't care if you have a sin this big or your sin is this big, because he says he says as far as from the east to the west. That right. that's like never ending forgiveness for your sins. Right. And you can't get another human being to do that. Yeah. But no, you can't. But Jesus did. That's, and that's and I'll thing. never forget that. And I just tell you know, for me, my job right now is glorifying him and everything I do. Um, when I first went to work at the church I, I thought I would never make it. They charged you know, I got a job for ten bucks an hour cutting grass. Yeah. I was making tons of money. And when they said that, I go, do you know how to cut grass? I said, I don't like grow grass. <laughs> and they go, no. We're not talking I know about how to bag it up. Yeah, and then, and then, and then I, I remember trying to fight with this weed whacker, and I never used a weed whacker in my life. And then when that little thing ran out, the twine, yeah. I was losing my mind, dude. I, I beat up that weed whacker. <laughs> but I, I, ended up going, I, love I, ended, it. I ended up going to uh, down to Home Depot, and I saw a couple guys out there, you know, those guys looking for work. And I went up to him and I said, hey, can you show me how to work this thing, man? I keep 20 bucks. Oh, yeah, sure. Look, sh I was like, oh, cool. Next thing you know, I was jamming with that thing. Yeah. I didn't care that I was making $10 an hour. I was actually happy. I was doing something. I was actually working normally, like a normal person. And Pastor Don used to watch me all the time. You know what? I thank God for him. I thank God he was my mentor. I thank God that he stood beside me because a lot of people looked at me. When I first went, I was rough. I, I, yeah. I scared a lot of people in there. And, and, I, and I hurt a lot of people in there physically and mentally. Yeah. And he could have threw me out. And he saw something in me that nobody else saw. And he stayed by my side and became my father. Yeah. He pretty much adopted me. <laughs> yeah. It Was it, and I'm probably going to, 
do this injustice. So I apologize to anybody who is going to hear this and, and go, ah, oh, he said it wrong. But Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you're a janitor who cleans toilets, clean the toilets like you're cleaning it for God. Amen. If you're gonna if you're gonna mow a lawn for the church for ten bucks an hour, mow it not yeah. for the ten dollars an hour, but mow it like you're mowing it for God. Cleaning His house. Yeah, you, yeah. work and, as and, unto the Lord. And I think it's I think that's I think that's something that's really forgotten with a lot of people. Yeah, and you know? and I'll tell you, it wasn't easy, uh, but I did it. And little by little, I got little raises here and there. Next thing you know, he found out I had uh, I knew a little bit about mechanics. So I was I was working on the church cars. Next thing you know, I was taking care of the school buses, the shuttle buses. The next thing you know, I became night janitorial. Next thing you know, I'm running the whole church and just hired, I hired a few guys. And it'd be, he goes, I want you to have your own company. We're going to call it Majestic Maintenance. That's what my company name was. That's cool. And uh, he said, I don't want you doing a lot of work, Ted. I want you letting these guys do the work. We're going to give you this much and we're going to pay you for everything and you pay them. And they go, I want you to just go out and tell people about Jesus. And that's what I did. And that's then from awesome. that day forward, dude, every time I'm on the phone, I don't care if it's Comcast, I don't care who it is, I'm telling them about Jesus. I prayed for more people just in the last couple of weeks on the phone. Uh, people I didn't know, even to go get my COVID test. I go get my COVID test. It was every week for a while. But every time I go in there, boom, I say, hey, you need prayer? And they'd be like, uh, I go, I'm a pastor. I'd like to pray for you. Oh, well, I'm good. And, I, and it's funny when people say, I'm good. And I'm like, really? You're good? Not one, well, yeah, there's this one thing. Well, let me pray for you. Yeah. So I, that's my job for me. That's what I believe God has put me down here, not just to preach, but to share the word of God and to, to pray for people. I love praying for people. And every time I get to pray for somebody, I'm like, thank you, God. Because if you look at the book of Job, God brought those three friends of his to him to pray because he knew he was a, a, a praying man. So that's what I believe. Whenever somebody asks me for prayer, God brought them to me, and it's a privilege to pray for that person. And I, I, I just can't wait. You know. And I tell people to this day right now, I know this all this garbage is going on right now, the pandemic, whatever, COVID, go back and forth. For me, I, I hope Jesus comes back today. You know Amen. I mean? I'm ready to go. I know. You know, and I don't want to deal with any of this anymore. I will. You know, Paul talks about it. You know, I'd rather be with him. Yeah. But because I'm here, right now, I need to be here for you. I'm here to. I'm here to share the word of God. I'm here to tell people, look, you can be out of your miserable life. I thought I was having the greatest life ever. I had money. I had cars. I had everything you could think of, but it didn't bring me any happiness. Right. My it's happiness. It, yes. You know? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, my happiness was to getting drunk and woman. You know, and that was that was my happiness. It's the biggest thing for me. And and you know what? Now I have my wife, my daughter. My daughter uh, is going to a church in Sacramento now. She's 33. She got when I got saved. She was 16 years old. She wouldn't come to church. She wouldn't come to church at all. About a month later, uh, me and my wife came home one Sunday after church, and there was two letters on my pillow. One on my pillow. One on my wife's. And she wrote a letter to both of us saying she was so happy that we became Christians because she, she could see the difference. I had a friend come by who said, every time I went in your house, all I heard was yelling and screaming. Mm -hmm. He goes, this is the most peaceful I've ever heard it. Not a peep. Yeah. And the book of Acts talks about you and your whole household. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about you. And it's, just not, it's not just about you going out witnessing people. It's about you being an example to your friends, your close friends, your family members. Because my mom got saved. 2014, right. at 84 years old. She gave her life to Jesus. Wow. Just by because she lived with me for 15 years. That's cool. I kept saying things, but she wasn't hearing it, but she was watching. Right. You see, we need to be the example. We need to be that light you're talking about. Don't cover it up, right? Right, exactly. And, and uh, my dad, my dad, I didn't speak to my dad for 30 years when he left me. Mm -hmm. And I went back to Puerto Rico in 2006. He had cancer. And uh, we reconciled. And uh, I thought I would never do that. Yeah. And uh, I remember going there and I seen his face for the first time and it was like, he didn't even know who I was. Mm -hmm. His sister goes, you don't know who that is? I went without even telling him I was coming. And my wife and I went together. And he goes, I don't know him. And then I walked up in his face and I said, hey, Pop. And he put his arm around me. And we spent a week together. And uh, <clears throat> that was when Comcast started in 1999. You can call anywhere in the United States. Well, yeah. Puerto Rico is considered United States kind yeah. of. So I would call him, and then we would, I would share the Bible with him, and I would tell him he had a hatred for his brother. i told him, you need to love your brother. Next thing you know, my dad got saved. He died a year later. Isn't it awesome that you're going to spend an eternity with him at one point? You know what? I tell people, when I went to church, I had no dad. My dad left me. Right. I didn't know God. I didn't have no dads. But you know what happened? I got to meet Pastor Don, who became my father, yeah. who introduced me to their heavenly father, yeah. and then got me to reconcile with my earthly father. 
Now I got three dads. Yeah. Now, Pastor, my dad died. Pastor Don died about four or five years ago. Uh, February 8th, I think, was his anniversary of his death. And I tell people, I can't wait to get up there with him. And I'm going to be worshiping with my two dads. Yeah. To the main oh, my dad. gosh. That's not cool. Yeah. I, I just, that goes through my head all the time. Cool. You know, no dads to three dads. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. No, thank you, Lord. No, thanks for, thank you for sharing your your story with us. And thank you so much. I, I, I know for a fact that this is going to bless so many people. It's powerful. One thing I would tell everybody is don't let anybody knock you down. Don't let anybody tell you you're not of worth because you're of worth. We are made in the likeness of God. And God made you special. Mm. And he has a purpose for you. And I don't care what the devil's whispering in your ear. And I don't care you know, what anybody tells you. Uh, I was the lowest of lows, drug addict. People were scared to have me in their house. And look what God did. Now I'm preaching his word. And now I'm telling people about Jesus. Don't let anybody, God made you worthy. God made you worthy, but you need to surrender mm -hmm. your life to Jesus. Because then he makes you righteous. Now you become righteous before God. And when God sees you, he sees his son, Jesus. So don't, don't give up. S surrender. <laughs> cool. Thanks, man. Amen. Appreciate it. God bless you. God bless you.